Not too long ago, I asked you on the community tab if you would email your problems and questions and dilemmas that were like autistic and neurodivergence related. The first one I'm going to respond to today, I really wanted to respond to as soon as possible because I feel like it's quite time sensitive. And I also think it's one that will resonate with a lot of people. It certainly does with me. No matter how old you are and where you are on your sort of employment journey, we know that there is a big employment gap for neurodivergent, for autistic in particular individuals was in 2021, the Office of National Statistics in the UK published new data that only 22% of autistic people are in employment. That is crazy. And yes, we can probably imagine that there are a lot of autistic people who are not diagnosed and probably those who are more successful in employment and at least have lives that look more outwardly successful, even if they have their own private struggles, they're probably less likely to be diagnosed than people who have more overt struggles. But even if say the problems only only half as bad and 42% of autistic people are not in employment, that's still pretty terrible. So there is a lot of work to be done for sure. I'm gonna keep the person anonymous, but hopefully it's okay to read out what they emailed to me. I'm also planning to post one extra video each month in this little autism advice series, but I'm gonna be doing that over on my Patreon, which you can join for $4 a month if you want to. You get a lot of perks for just joining that tier, including two exclusive videos, Discord access, and if you join before the 12th of November, you get this purple button badge. This wooden badge is available on some of the higher tiers and then you can get both if you join the highest tier. Hi, I recently finished university and now I've been thrown into the big scary world of job seeking and employment. It can feel big and scary for sure. It's safe to say I hate it. I hate it with a visceral passion, relate. <laughs> my mother has been nagging and begging for me to get a job since the very day I received my national insurance number. So that's kind of a number that you're given in the UK. I don't know, it's a social security number in the US. I think it's like the equivalent of that. You get it when you're 16 and then it means that you can get a job basically from that point onwards. But alas, I never have. I tried but never got anywhere. It got to the point towards the end of college where I was exhausted and burnt out, so much so that I finally started looking into autism and here we are. Plus, this was also at the beginning of COVID times, so I was even less likely to have any look at finding anything. Yeah, I mean, it's probably negatively affected a lot of people who are graduating now in various ways, for sure. My husband's like basically entire nutrition degree and his dietetics masters was like colored in some way by COVID. It's crazy. When I was at uni, I knew it would be useful for me to have a part-time job alongside studying to earn some extra money, but the mixture of COVID still being a thing and still settling in at this new environment meant that I didn't try very hard. I think a lot of people really struggle to keep up a job, a part-time job at the same time as being at uni. I went to a few interviews, but ultimately by the time I got halfway through my third year, having still not secured anything, I decided I'd rather direct all my focus to my dissertation studying instead of getting distracted by job hunting on the side. Then of course, as soon as I handed in my dissertation, there she went again, start searching for jobs. I basically just ignored her because I knew I needed at least a month to just chill and process the last 21 years of my life before I went into that. I think that is a very intelligent decision, particularly when you've spoken about feeling like you were burnt out already previously. I have told my mom that I think I'm autistic, currently in the process of seeking a diagnosis, yet another thing on my plate to think about. I don't think she understands that I mean that I have a genuine disability and not that I'm just a bit quiet and weird. Yeah, com completely relate. I think it does take people time because I think the general public knowledge of autism is so poor and skewed and it does make it a lot harder for us when we have to try and explain to our families. I mean, obviously if the general knowledge was better, we all probably would have been diagnosed as children. And you know, hopefully things are just gonna continue to change and we're not gonna have to go through this whole process where you have to convince all of your family members of your disability way later in life because it just puts you in a really awkward, difficult position. So I completely feel for you. So far, job seeking is absolutely exhausting. It's emotionally tiring and I imagine it can be for so many neurotypicals too, but I feel like being autistic makes it all so much worse. There's extra anxiety involved. Yeah, so many phone calls, interviews. I feel like an imposter constantly lying to these people. The whole language and culture around employment really confuses me and feels like one big lie. Yeah, I think we really struggle with that and I think that could be some of the, the problem. I don't really have any other work experience aside from one summer where I volunteered in the library for the kids summer reading challenge. I used to love the kids summer reading challenge at my local libraries and basically sat at the desk doing nothing for an hour for a few days a week. Ah, okay, I see. This is the problem. Like even when you go out of your way to get work experience, you can just end up, you know, at best making tea and coffee for people. And it's really frustrating. It's like we're really pushed to get work experience, but there 
there isn't a lot out there for us that is actually genuinely helpful. That immediately gives me a setback in the strange competition, but there's also the fact that I'm just naturally, I'm very reserved and quiet and just don't stand out. That's how I've always been. I don't stand out. I blend into the background and this of course does not bode well for me in employment situations. Oh, it makes me feel a bit emotional to read that. When I was in high school and I was like struggling with fitting in and making friends. I remember sometimes I'd walk around with groups and I'd just feel so like I didn't know how to speak. I'd feel like I, I couldn't get words out of my mouth. I couldn't express myself the way I wanted to. And I remember sometimes being like, if I disappeared from this group, if I just evaporated right now, nobody would notice. And then sometimes they would be walking and I would just stop walking and I would just wait to see if anybody noticed that I wasn't walking with them and then nobody would. And then I'd like catch up with them and carry on. Anyway, then there's the anxious wait to see if I've got the job or not, within which I start to get hopeful. Maybe this time is the time. Sometimes the way employers act at interviews leads me into thinking I've definitely got it and I get excited, only to later get an email saying sorry but no, and I'm let down again. This constant emotional roller coaster is exhausting and I'm afraid I'm going to burn out. People always say, well, it's good practice for future interviews at least, but I just can't think of it that way. I just see it as a huge waste of my time. I went through all the anxiety and dread for nothing. The last interview I did, I was brought to tears several times because of how anxiety ridden I was and was very close to just not turning up. I completely get that and relate to that feeling. If you've seen my video on monotropism, if not, I'd probably recommend watching that one on that theory of autism. But autistic people tend to kind of turn their attention towards one thing and get more kind of intensely focused on that one thing. So I think for us, if we're preparing for a job interview, we're probably taking it very seriously. It's probably the only thing on our minds. We might be being quite perfectionist about the whole thing. We're just putting more mental energy into it. And I think then the stakes feel higher because of that. And then maybe we get more upset when we don't get the job. So I'll talk a little bit in a minute about how I might deal with that myself personally, if I was in your shoes. I hardly even know what I want to do at this point. I know I love writing and that's what I want to do. But unfortunately for me, it's a career choice that's extra hard to make a living out of. It's a hard industry to get into. Yeah, me too. I always get super into things that are really hard to do as a career. And I'm like, why am I like this? Why don't I just wanna be a lawyer, you know? Like, just make it easy for yourself, man. I know I should probably just be honest with my mother and hope that maybe she'll start to understand how difficult it is for me. But of course, that's easier said than done. Especially on TikTok, I see a lot of other autistic people talking about how difficult it is for them to stay in a job. But honestly, I'm sat here wondering how they get those jobs in the first place. It makes me a little jealous, if I'm honest. I'm lucky that I live in a stable in our family where I can survive off allowance from my parents for now but it won't always be that way and I do have a desire to be independent one day. I apologize that this is a very long email, don't apologize but if I can even get an ounce of advice or even just comfort of knowing I'm not alone that would be helpful. Please share your own stories in the comments. Let's help show this person that they're not alone because they most certainly are not alone. First of all I just want to say congratulations on finishing your degree. I just want to say it's really impressive that you did manage to finish even though you were feeling burnt out and I think the fact that you decided not to get a job was maybe the right decision. And here you are, you finished, you know, you should be so proud of yourself. That is a massive achievement. And anyone who's watching this who hasn't managed to finish a degree, a lot of us, you know, we start things, we drop out. Hopefully we'll get there together eventually. I also want to say I can tell you're a writer that was really, really well written. And I think any employer would be really, really lucky to have you. Imagine how great your emails will be. So there are a few things here for us to address. So number one is why are you not getting a job? Is that maybe to do with lack of experience? What can you do? to try and help you get a job like all these other people on TikTok. Number two, we have the fact that you're not quite sure what you want to do. Number three, that you hate the jargon. You feel like it's all a big lie. You could maybe feel a bit like an imposter. Number four, we have the fact that you feel like you might want to be a writer, but then that's super hard to get into. And then number five, we have the fact that now you've moved home, you feel like your mom is nagging you to get a job. First of all, do I have any tips to maybe help you get the job as you feel like you've had quite a lot of unsuccessful interviews so far. Employment has always been a massive struggle for me throughout my whole life. I, I knew it would be before I even got to that, that stage. Just the idea of having a job made me very apprehensive as a child. I have been self-employed for a long time now, but I have done, I think 10 when I tried to count through it, I think 10 interviews throughout my life. I've got the job seven times. And then I also have employed people a few times for my own businesses as well. So I have a bit of experience on the other side. It might not make you feel any better, but it is quite common for it to take a long time for people to find 
employment. And also you have to be doing something right in order to be getting to the point of interviews. So you should probably feel quite proud of yourself. And it seems like some of your interviews that you've done have gone pretty well and you've had a good rapport with the person. So it might just be to do with the competitiveness of the role. And you know, it's probably just a bit of a numbers game. If you apply to enough, you know, only one person has to say, yes, you are gonna get there eventually. And you don't know from these people on TikTok, like they might have applied for a hundred jobs. You have no idea in order to get to that one position. There's a quote in this book, 80,000 hours, find a fulfilling career that does good, which you can actually get for free on the 80,000 hours website. I'll leave a link to it. In their how to find a job section, this is what it says. We interviewed someone who's now a top NPR journalist, but when he started out, he applied to 70 positions and received only one offer that paid over $10,000. It normally takes 20 to 100 to find one good job and getting rejected 20 times is normal. In fact, the average length of a spell of unemployment employment in the US as of February 2016 is seven months so be prepared for your job hunt to take that long. You only need one person to say yes, you only need one job, you don't need a hundred of them, it's okay if it takes a bit of time. I know one of the things you're concerned about is lack of experience and how that might be holding you back and that is a common issue yeah, every job kind of wants you to get experience but then it's like how do you get experience? You need experience to get experience and it's just the cycle but having had previous paid work experience is not the only way to show that you're the the best candidate for the role. So one idea to kind of make yourself stand out a little bit more might be to think about how you can demonstrate your skills, how you can maybe create a little project that proves that you're able to do the things that the job role would require you to do on a day-to-day -day basis. I always remember hearing about Sana from Books and Quills. She's a booktuber. In order to get her first job as a social media coordinator in London in the publishing industry, which is very competitive, she chose a particular book that was being published by that publisher that she was applying to. I think it was like a pirate related one maybe and she made like some sort of little digital treasure hunt thing, submitted that along with her application to kind of prove that she could do the work. Look, I've already made something for you. Myself, when I applied for a job at Waterstones, it was just a, a bookseller, which was one of the times I interviewed successfully. I ended up deciding not to take the job. I was a booktuber at that time. So I made a little video cover letter and I had like my books behind me and I spoke about some of my favorite books. And then I obviously also linked to the booktube channel. So even though I never had experience selling books before, they still were interested in hiring me because I was like, look, I genuinely am interested in books and I know that this is what this role involves and I've looked at applications myself. So few people have even listened to what I've asked them to send in. So if somebody was then to go above and beyond and do something a little bit extra, which is rare, it makes a huge difference in how you see them and it makes them massively stand out. I know a lot of applications these days are just done through online and they're very standard, but then you can prepare a little bit extra for when you do get to the interview. Maybe when they ask you if you have any questions at the end and things like that, you can be like, oh, I made this little extra thing for you just to kind of showcase what I would do if I was in this role. I thought about how we can maybe redesign this page of the website. It depends what the role is. And maybe for some roles, this will be more applicable than others. And if you struggle socializing and making yourself stand out in terms of like, how you come across, maybe you feel like you're not always the most charismatic person. That is one way that you can go away, work quietly on your own, be, you know, your introverted self and then present someone with something that can speak for you. Another thing that might be helpful is just to actually get some more experience, which I know is easier said than done. And again, it depends on what kind of industry you're trying to get into and what sort of jobs you're trying to apply to, but it doesn't necessarily have to be paid experience. And you could contact companies online. You could offer to do some work for them for free. Like say you were trying to get into marketing, you could offer to do some social media marketing for free. There'd be no risk to them. Just say, you know, I'll make a few posts. If you like them, you can share them. You don't have to if you don't want to. There are online creators as well. Like I've had one person message me, that's it. The whole time I've been doing this for almost a year to offer to do some editing for me, which was, it's nice. I, I didn't wasn't looking for any help with it at the time, but you know, I still have that person's email address. I said, do you mind if I just keep it on file? Even better if you can already have done something for that person as an example of your work and then send it over. Over. I'm sure if what you're doing is good and you know you message enough pe people again it becomes a bit of a numbers game someone will probably say yes and it may even lead to a bit of a paid like freelance thing and then hey you've got some money and some experience you never know I certainly would never have anyone you know editing for me on paid or anything like that a lot of industries are on Twitter like even you know NHS roles like dietitians and psychologists they'll have like a bit of a Twitter and Instagram as well community and they'll often share roles on there and sometimes there are digital roles like digital volunteer things you can do. That's how my husband got experience to get onto his dietetics course 
during COVID. He did, I think it was a charity called Bags of Taste or something. They sent ingredients to people that helped them to make healthy home cooked meals. And then my kind of my husband's job was to run the WhatsApp group and chat to these people and then give them a call to check how they were getting on. And, and then he also had kind of a digital internship where he did social media for this little company that a few dietitians set up. So it's just maybe being creative about how you can find some experience. It doesn't necessarily have to be traditional ways. And you don't have to have loads on your CV. Like a lot of people will say, if you've done heaps and heaps of things, don't put it all on. Only pick the things that are most relevant and put those first at the top of your CV. You do not have to be extroverted to get a job. Whenever I have done work experience, I went to a lot of different media agencies. I did some in work experience in TV. <laughs> the amount of people who I'm looking back, I'm like, oh, definitely neurodivergent. Yep, they were awkward as hell. Yep, they barely said a word to me the whole time. Like people are not all super loud and sociable and extroverted. There may be people who interview you who just don't get you and you don't click. If somebody doesn't get you, then cool you know you're also interviewing them in some way remember that you know it's not all on you I don't know if any of that's helpful you may feel like you're already doing some of those things but there were a few other things to unpack here so let's talk about the fact that you're not really sure what you want to do I feel like we grow up in a culture where it's kind of shoved down your throat that you need to have a passion you need to have this one thing you love to do more than anything we see a lot of celebrities and things saying oh I always knew I was going to do this since I was three years old and it's just been my calling and that isn't the reality for a lot of people I think I felt that a lot and I had a lot of pressure to commit to doing something when I was like 14 and then that needed to be the thing. You know, once I committed to filmmaking as my thing, I was like, that needs to be what I do for the rest of my life. And some of that was influenced by the fact that my mom was an artist and she'd always known she wanted to be an artist. I think it can even be harmful. You don't know what is out there unless you try it. You don't want to put yourself in a box too early. So actually not knowing entirely what you want to do, it's, it's not necessarily a huge issue. I think it can be overwhelming because there's a lot of options and autistic people tend to not love making decisions and you know dwell on them a lot you probably won't be doing the same thing 10 years from now anyway if that is comforting at all to you the job that you do in 10 years time may not even exist right now i think it's just good to start somewhere and then pivot and edit as you go like did i think i was gonna be sat here filming youtube videos about autism things change and life is weird and i'm always surprised by the weird twists and turns that my life path has taken there is no way i could have sat in my room at 14 and predicted anything and that's great because you know the things i could have thought of when i was 14 are nowhere near as good as the things i actually have been able to do you know it might be good to just imagine which is kind of something that's spoken about a little bit in this book just to kind of see the next couple of years as an experimental time to try out different things do a job role for six months or so and then be like mm, do i like this what do i like what don't i like and then kind of you know, switch to something else that might be a better fit for you. And maybe you can kind of find your ideal role that way. Obviously with being autistic, you may find job roles that are more suited to your special interests, maybe that have writing as a component in them. Maybe you could write a list of all the things you've been interested in throughout your life and maybe see if any jobs cross over with that. I don't know whether your degree was connected to any of your interests at all. I think often people tend to enjoy jobs that can kind of get them in that flow state where, you know, they lose track of time and they're just super into what they're doing. And that's probably very true for autistic people. That often tends to be our preferred state to be in. So if there's a job that you think, hmm, this has the potential for me to spend a large part of my day kind of undisturbed in a flow state, then that might be a job that's maybe a bit more attractive. Obviously you're quite conscious about burnout, which I think is great. You could maybe have a list of like non-negotiable that I don't want to travel any further than this. My commute needs to be shorter than this amount of time. You might think I would love a job that would allow me to work from home. I think that would really help me to have a little bit more recovery time in the evenings because I'm not worrying about traveling. Maybe you write a list of kind of work conditions, thinking about what you found good and what you found difficult about the university experience and kind of make a criteria. And then that might make it easier to sort between positions. And I think a lot of autistic people do like to feel like there's a purpose behind what we're doing and I think maybe that's why you know when you do an interview and you're not getting the job it makes it feel meaningless and pointless to you and that's quite difficult I know I definitely always need to feel like I am doing this for a reason and sometimes money and just getting a job because we should doesn't feel like enough for us so I think maybe finding a job that you feel like is at least ethically neutral or is you know something that involves doing good 
can be useful but also you know there are jobs available at charities the National Autistic Society in the UK really try and encourage autistic people to apply for their jobs which I think is really really wonderful they have a job search page on their website that you can have a look at and you know if you do get a diagnosis in the future and even if you just explain that you're on the pathway to being diagnosed they'd probably be much more likely to give you accommodation so they could be a really great employer to have and it might be worth looking at particularly if that's an area of interest for you right now PDA society Society also often lists jobs and they like to employ PDAers and then there's also just the website charity jobs in the UK it could help you to maybe feel like what you're doing is not completely frivolous and you know just helping to make someone who's rich more rich so now let's move on to the fact that you you know you hate the jargon you said you hate it with a visceral passion it feels false it makes you feel like an imposter and like you're lying imposter syndrome is very common in general but I think if you are a perfectionist you probably feel more wary of talking yourself up and saying look this is how great I am because you feel like you want to give more of a like honest picture again if you watch my video on monotropism it maybe makes sense that you have such a visceral reaction because we can be quite linear thinkers we like things to be direct and honest. We like things to, you know, mean what they say. And a lot of the language around employment just seems kind of fluffy and wordy. And you're not always sure exactly what they're talking about. And I think when things aren't straightforward, it kind of takes an extra step for us to process it in our minds. Even if that happens very quickly, it still is an extra step compared to most people. And I think that's part of the reason why it feels frustrating. It's like, oh, just say what you mean. My husband feels the same and he's neurotypical, but he is able to kind of bury it. He's able to acknowledge it and go, lol, that's stupid, and then just kind of carry on and play along and it doesn't seem to affect him as deeply whereas I think autistic people often find it harder to do things that they don't agree with and understand the point of doing things they don't agree with. Maybe it's good to be a little bit more selfish. Just think about what you want and your reasons why maybe more than them. I'm trying to learn to do that, you know, to read something, have my reaction to it and remind myself what I'm doing it for and what I want. And you're not lying when you're in the interview. The point of the conversation is to show the person that you're the the right fit for the role and to tell them all of the good things about you that that's the point of an interview and maybe trying to remember that the interviewer is on your side you know they want to find a great employee when I interview somebody I'm not sat there like oh god I hope this person's really crap that would be hilarious if they messed up I hope they're really awkward you know I'm, I'm hoping that I get someone who's a good fit for me I also wonder if one of the reasons why there's this employment gap is because we're so perfectionist and we read these job listings that are often quite hyperbolic, they're quite dramatic, they're like, we need an incredible communicator who thrives under stress and pressure and loves Mondays and has never frowned in their entire life. And like, if you read that as an autistic person and you're maybe more of a literal thinker, you might be like, mm, well, that's not me. That's not always me every day. And then you might decide not to apply. Maybe you hold yourself back from positions that you actually could be a good fit for. So I want to also touch on the whole being a writer thing. Since I was probably about six years old, I have wanted to be an author specifically of fiction. I came to the conclusion that for myself at the life stage I was at, thinking about the kind of sort of lifestyle I wanted for me and my family, I was like, writing is very unlikely to get me there. And therefore I decided to, you know, just take a step back for now. Research shows that the income of professional authors averages about £7,000 per year. Then then you look at the average household income for authors and it's significantly higher so it seems like it's a lot of people who have other jobs which you know it definitely is possible to work another job and write as well it probably depends on how exhausting your job is because again you don't want to burn yourself out and then also people who have partners who can support them and it, it's sad it's really sad that it is that way and it seems to only be getting worse unfortunately and there's this video that I watched a long time ago that always stayed in my mind I didn't necessarily love it at the time I found it quite uncomfortable to watch and even re-watching it now I'm a bit like mm, I'm not too sure how I feel about that probably it's a lot of the jargon around employment and stuff because because that also gets under my skin a little bit. But there's a video from Elizabeth Gilbert, who obviously is a writer of both fiction and nonfiction, and she talks about how there's a difference between a hobby, a vocation, a career, and a job. Some people might find it helpful. Parts of that video I struggle with because I do think it's kind of throw away, like, oh, just, just get a job. And it's like, your job, your working life is the majority of your life on this earth. You know, most of us have to 
give a lot of our lives to work and I think it's important that we do get at least some enjoyment from what we do or at least that it doesn't hurt us. One thing that I do think is kind of a relief is that you know no one can take the fact that you're a writer away from you even if now you decide at this point in my life I just want to have a job and I want to be able to get my independence and move out and writing isn't going to get me there in the time frame that I would like to do it so I'm deciding to step away from that right now doesn't mean you're not a writer and I mean you can still write every day even if it's you know just a journal just a bit of free writing of whatever you feel and whatever pops into your head and maybe starting a blog about your diagnosis process or even just about how difficult it's been getting a job and you know graduate life I don't know you could even start a business on the side like for me I wanted to be a filmmaker for me to have made it as a director of you know films or music videos which was something I wanted to do when I was younger it would have been super hard for me to get into I wanted to move out when I was 19 I wanted to have my own space and my own freedom and so I started a business where I offered videography as a service to other businesses and for recording events. That was how I was able to make money. It's a lot easier to make money through creative things if you're offering a service to people rather than I'm making some art, please like it and pay me for it. That is always more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult. I just wanna to touch on the fact that your mom is kind of, you know, nagging you and is also not kind of entirely understanding of why you want to pursue an autism diagnosis. I think most people in my life, it seems hard to believe now because it's just a very accepted part of who I am, but at the start were kind of doubtful. If there's books that you've read, videos that you've seen that you think could be useful, you know, send them on. It might just be a case of you know, drip feeding information and eventually she'll kind of wrap her head around it. I think getting an official diagnosis could be super helpful. If you're a little bit unsure about how to go about doing that and the process, I have a video of like what to do if you think you might be autistic. You may also find it easier to discuss how you're feeling with your mom without using the word autism. Sometimes people don't really understand very much about it and so it actually can create a bit of a barrier. You know if you just want to get across that you're having a lot of anxiety around the application and the interview process it might be better just to communicate it in terms of how you're feeling. You as a person, this is the reaction that you're having towards things rather than using the word autism. Because yeah, if people don't understand what autism is, it isn't always necessarily adding any more useful information. But the fact that you're feeling quite panicked, I think in general, it's a good idea to kind of lower the stakes of the interviews. And I think one of the things that won't be helping you is the fact that you feel extra pressure from your mom. Maybe it's a good idea to explain to her that you have been getting quite panicked. It's quite a stressful, experience for you because you care a lot about getting these jobs you really want to get a job I mean like you're on the same side here it doesn't have to be an accusation but you could just be like I think it would be helpful if I felt a little bit less pressure from the people around you or just when you say this it makes me feel like this I get this feeling inside I know you're only doing this because you care about me and you want me to be successful but at the moment I feel like it's actually making me worse because I, ca I care too much when I get in the interviews that's one thing that I think neurotypicals are much better at doing than autistic people are is like not making your whole life about one thing not putting so much pressure on one thing having to go exactly the way we want it to and I think it's difficult when you've been at university and you've lived independently and then you have to come back and live kind of under your parents and be in that hierarchy again but at the same time you are an adult and you are you are doing the thing you are going through job interviews and she doesn't necessarily need to be breathing down your neck but I'm sure she's doing it out of kindness and love and concern and often parents get very concerned about gaps in CVs and stuff but as you've heard from that statistic a lot of people don't find a job instantly if you're still struggling a lot with the panic attack sort of feelings it might be worth self-referring for a talking therapy I don't know what it will be called in your area you can probably find out by just googling in the UK you can self-refer to people called psychological well-being practitioners practitioners and that's on the NHS and then if you kind of meet their criteria for depression or anxiety they can treat you. When I did it it was kind of a combination of mostly CBT but some mindfulness in there as well. I feel like a lot of people in the autistic community don't like CBT and that is something I want to explore in future videos. Personally for me when I was going through health difficulties it was helpful for me to reframe it because it does deal with things like black and white thinking. To some extent just having somebody to talk to, the person who I spoke to was really nice and so I was lucky there. Just having like you know this regular check-in with someone it can be really helpful. And maybe I wouldn't mention about being autistic, obviously I definitely recommend starting the process of getting a diagnosis through your GP but maybe don't mention to the psychological well-being practitioner because I know unfortunately it is a problem in this country particularly sometimes people don't want to give you mental health treatment when they know you're autistic because they'll say oh you're anxious because you're autistic and it's like mm, being autistic does not mean that you're definitely going to be mentally ill we do struggle with mental illness at a disproportionate rate 
but it's not inherent to autism. We can be happy. Like right now, I would not consider myself a mentally ill person. I will consider myself with tendencies towards feeling both anxious and depressed. And I do live with some amount of anxiety, but it's not overtaking my life. It's quite a short treatment. It's, it's not gonna change your life, but I think it's one little extra thing you can do. And if you feel like your thinking is quite negative around the whole job process, CBT might not be the worst thing. If you want mental health treatment, it does tend to be the first thing that's offered. And it does worry me a bit when people are like, oh, CBT just doesn't work for neurodivergent people because okay, then what are neurodivergent people supposed to do? It would be great if we had more neurodivergent specific therapies in the future for sure and I don't think it's perfect but I think potentially it could be beneficial. Mindfulness might be a good option. I quite like the book The Happiness Trap by Russ Harris which is about acceptance commitment therapy. I think can be pretty great for autistic people. Again the book is not written with neurodivergent people in mind so you have to take some of it with a grain of salt. Same with the 80,000 hours book to do with employment you know. Take it with a grain of salt which we kind of always have to do until we have more things that are made for us specifically. It helps you with sitting in negative feelings because you can end up kind of like angry angry at yourself for the way that you're feeling and then it just becomes a cycle. You, you, you feel negative emotions about your negative emotions. As Elizabeth Gilbert often says, done is better than good keep showing up. You will get somewhere. You only need one person to say yes. Think about your goals. Be selfish. You're not doing it for them for the interview. You're doing this for yourself. I hope that helped even a tiny bit. Thank you so much for sharing your situation with me. Feel free, anyone who submitted these problems, if you have kind of like a follow-up question or anything, feel free to send it via email. I'm wishing you the best of luck. Okay, question slash problem number two connected to the employment theme. Here's a question for the new series. As a freelancer slash self-employed pda -er, what do you tell clients about when they can expect deliverables to avoid that becoming a demand? So if you don't know, PDA stands unfortunately for pathological demand avoidance, which is commonly widely accepted as a profile of autism. I have quite a few videos on it. I'll leave the playlist link down below. If you feel like you hate being told what to do and you also feel like sometimes maybe you're a little bit social to be seen as autistic, then you might fit that profile. So I kind of also had a question in a comment, which I'll kind of tie in with this one about like, basically how is self-employment any different when you've got clients demanding that you do things to being in a job? Because I've spoken a lot about how I always loved the concept of being a freelancer. For me, it is just all about the freedom. I can wake up whenever I want to. I don't have to commute. And I always found, you know, commuting into college and stuff, extremely exhausting. I don't have to dress a certain way. I can take holidays whenever I want if I wake up and I. I'm having a bad day, I have endometriosis, say I have really bad cramps, I technically don't have to work or I can sit in my bed to work. You know, I pretty much always would choose to work. I don't feel like there's a gun to my head and someone telling me I have to. I'm always the one making the decisions. I do have the ability to outsource if there's a particular task I don't want to do or I feel like I need a break from. I can technically hire other people and ask them to do it. Also, I run a business that has a very set service that I offer a particular type of event that I film, it's not weddings. <laughs> this is the package that you get. This is how much it costs. You know, you sign a contract, you agree to this, this, and this. I've decided the terms of the contract and then people sign it and they agree to those terms and people know what to expect. They've seen examples. It's very rare that I'll be asked to make any alterations. Most people who I work with now, I've been working with for, you know, five plus years at least. So they kind of know what to expect. And most of the changes are just tiny tweaks and are more to do with things on their end than to do with my end. With the turnaround time, I work a lot with technology and some of it has to be relatively old technology for what I do. And there are a lot of things that can go wrong. So I tend to give myself quite a buffer with the turnaround time anyway. And I found that as long as people are aware, people are fine and then you know, hopefully things are done faster than the turnaround that I give people and then that's a positive thing. When you're self-employed and when you're running a business, it definitely feels like a more equal relationship to how I've ever felt in the past being like under a manager. Most people are very respectful and nice and they coming to you because they like the work that you do. Any clients can come to me and ask me to do a piece of work for them, but I can always say, no, that's not something I offer and turn it down. You know, at the end of the day, I have the choice of which clients I accept. It kind of always feels like 
I'm choosing to do it every day, you know? Like it feels like I could technically just wake up tomorrow and refund everyone and just not do any of the work if I wanted to. Like no one can fire me, but I want to. I want to do a good job. I want to meet the turnaround times. I like these people. I've built up good relationships with these people. When you have your own business, you set the expectations and it depends what industry you're in and what is typical for that industry. <laughs> the company who made these badges for my Patreon, <laughs> man, they did not do quick turnarounds. And I messaged and was like, oh, is there any way, you know, you can do it faster? Like, can you pay a little bit extra for an express or whatever? And they were like, no, this is how it is. When you run your own business, you can you can set the expectations. And we'll do one more because this one's connected to writing again. Oh, this person was really sweet. They said, hello, Megan. Thank you so much for making this series. You're gonna help so many people. I've been waffling for about an hour. So I hope there's been something useful in what I've said in this footage. I know before in some videos you've mentioned you're a writer and I am too. I was wondering if you have any tips for writing with executive dysfunction as it's one of my main struggles being neurodivergent. I would like to be kept anonymous. You will be. Thanks so much. Okay, I made a video about 12 tips to live as a pda -er, which might be quite helpful for anyone who's dealing with autistic inertia and demand avoidance me but I'll leave a link to that if you're interested that's just basically how I managed to chaotically run a business and actually get some stuff done again I don't know what type of writer you are it doesn't necessarily matter I'm imagining for creative pursuits whether that's you know fiction or non-fiction I'm not sure I don't know what it is about writers why do we all bloody hate writing I don't know like this is the thing now I don't know I'm putting words in your mouth there but you know that is the vibe you get from writers sometimes and my mom as I said is a sculptor and I've never heard her complain about what she does. She's always really keen to get up in the morning and just get on with it. I, I don't know, I think my theory is with writing, you're kind of staring at a blank page. It's not very stimulating maybe, not very visually stimulating, and that might be why maybe there's a bit of resistance. It can be hard to get into that flow state with writing. I think we're always kind of chasing, trying to get into that state. I really love Stephen King's book on writing. I've read it several times. I find that reading it does give me inspiration. So that might be, you know, my first tip. But he talks about how he could, I don't know if it was playing the saxophone his son wanted to start playing the saxophone and he could tell that his son didn't love it because he only practiced for the, you know the set amount of time he was supposed to practice every day he never did anything more than that he was you know quite happy to walk away from it, it can be really difficult to know if you know we're just struggling in the moment we just got writer's block whatever or if we really just you know maybe it's an old dream and we don't really want to do it anymore and there are other things that we've grown to love more as we've got older if you haven't read big magic by elizabeth gilbert oh please read this book it's amazing as well as that book elizabeth gilbert has the big magic podcast and i would really recommend listening to one particular episode I'll find out which one it is and put it on screen and in the description as well she interviews a lawyer and it's someone who is very successful as a lawyer and then she left that job later on in life to try and pursue writing because she'd always wanted to do it I don't think she'd enjoyed being a lawyer very much she wrote a book it did really well and then the problem was she was struggling to write her second book which a lot of people do so what Liz said to her was she wanted her to take a break completely walk away I don't know if it was for a couple of months maybe or a few weeks whatever it was it was quite a long period of time I was surprised I was like oh because you know we're so used to hearing that advice of you need to write every day just do gardening potter around and then see how much you miss writing basically see how much you want to go back because maybe you just had one book in you like she was you know kind of fearing you know maybe she just couldn't do it again or maybe you'll be desperate you'll be itching to be back in that chair and going back to writing once you you know tell yourself you can't do it anymore it, you know might be quite a good psychological tactic and then you know if you do feel like you want to go back at the end of this period of time that she'd forbidden her from writing then to use I think she said like use an hourglass or a timer or something and set a period of time like maybe it was like 20 minutes or something and then you come back and you just sit and you write for that amount of time and yeah just see if the break kind of helps and Elizabeth Gilbert talks a lot I think her writing process is very on off she has seasons of writing intensely and then seasons of not writing and just gardening she tends to often have these kind of almost like hyper fixations that she then ends up writing novels or non-fiction things about so she has a break from actual writing to go and experience some life find what she's interested in and what she wants to delve into and then she writes the book which I think is you know a bit different to Stephen King's advice in this book which is kind of like I think write 2,000 words a day um, we've got two very different things here and then also in Big Magic Elizabeth Gilbert talks about making writing 
more fun, like less of a chore basically, and maybe doing it in an unconventional way. There's somebody who she mentions in the book who was struggling to write, but was quite a good communicator and good at telling stories verbally. So I think she hired a holiday home, brought some friends along, and then she talked out her story, I don't know if she was writing non-fiction maybe, but she talked out the anecdotes and then her friends, I don't know if they transcribed them for her as she was speaking and then she typed them up. Just basically the idea is think about what will be the easiest way for you to get your story out, even if it's unconventional and weird. I have been on quite a break from writing myself. I think now that I understand a lot more about autism, I will probably be writing quite differently when I go back to writing because I feel like I will. I feel like I always have an ideas in the back of my head, maybe sitting in a chair at a desk the way I thought writing should be done and you know you sit there for a set amount of time and if you don't want to write you stare at the wall but you're not allowed to get up and you're not allowed to go on the internet like maybe that isn't the most neurodivergent friendly way to write always like maybe it'd be better to stim as you write I often get a lot of my ideas like hand flapping and walking around on my toes and you're know, speaking out loud and muttering to myself and I'm like maybe I should move and I should actually speak my story into my recording app maybe having a standing desk so you can move around a lot more just thinking about how can you make it more stimulating and how how can you make it more fun might help to encourage you to want to do it. I also think I want to plan more. I've always been somebody who's been a bit of a like kind of snob almost about like uh, all the best authors seem to just write you know whatever comes into their head and do it intuitively. They don't plan anything beforehand and I'm like Mm, I don't think that's entirely true because I think now I understand about monotropism I'd often find myself writing too many words can you tell I like a ramble I don't know and I would get stuck on a certain scene and write and write a lot of it would end up having to be cut because I was just kind of saying the same thing again and again I just thinking about monotropism and the way we kind of you know we like one thing to neatly follow another I'm like if I had a really good plan would that not help me so there is the book save the cat writes a novel i don't know if you write novels but if you do that might be helpful for you a lot of people really really swear by it i'll leave a link to that down below as well we've got quite a lot of books linked in this one but they're all great books that might be helpful like you know i think for me i don't like uncertainty and just seeing a blank page is a bit foreboding and i think no i need to be less of a snob and maybe just try and plan trying different things reading different people's methods and not thinking that you need to do it in one set way because like i do love this book and I find it inspiring but I mean Stephen King managed to write 2,000 words a day because he was in his basement sometimes taking drugs while his wife looked after his children upstairs who was also a writer who you know didn't write as much as Stephen King did let's just say that because you know she supported him basically and enabled him to do it so you kind of also got to think about your life stage and like should you be holding yourself I don't know if you do hold yourself to word count goals and put a lot of pressure on yourself but like you got to think about you know where are you in your life stage do you have that much time to devote to writing to do 2,000 words a day is that what you want to do right now a little goes a long way like if you wrote 220 words every day which is significantly less than that you'd still have 80,000 words at the end of a year and you don't have to write every day you can have seasons of writing you could write only on weekends you can write one day a week I think it's just remembering that it's supposed to be fun it's supposed to be an extra thing like nobody does it to get rich let's let's be honest you know as I shared before thinking about how to keep it fun and keep yourself wanting to do it and keep it engaging and you know neurodivergent friendly in a way like maybe we need to move a little bit while we do it and that's okay it doesn't have to be a sat at a desk in a suit with a typewriter kind of thing if you know what I mean and if you would like to sign up to the Patreon remember 12th of November is the last day to get your badges the first tier you get like the purple button badge if you join if you join the second tier you get the wooden eco badge and then if you join the third tier you get both badges but only if you join before that date we'll post them internationally and then also you get a whole bunch of other stuff loads of stuff probably gone overboard with the amount of things that I offer if you join the patreon I'll also leave a link to the introduction video on screen as well if you would like to see the tour of the patreon and the discord and all that come and be an anti-social snail with me I would love to see you there and I can do some more of these videos over there and give you <gasps> some more advice if you want. Who wouldn't want advice from me? Oh my god, I feel so skilled. I don't know what's going on. I don't think I got enough sleep last night. <laughs> Bye!